In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good and gracious Father, thank you for this day and the opportunity for us to spend time in your word together. Open our hearts and minds to be alert to what the author of the book of Hebrews is doing, what he was doing for his church then, and what he is doing for Christ's church today through us preaching and proclaiming it. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, you guys might know a lot of this stuff. I've never taught Hebrews before, so I've been giving myself a crash course on it. A lot of it comes right from, from the Concordia Commentary and a couple other books. But there's some really neat background stuff that we tend to skip when we do Bible studies. And I don't know about your people, but mine kind of like this stuff in small doses. So we'll have one big session about it and tell them all the weird stuff, background information, and then we'll actually start talking about the book. And it turns out, that, has anybody actually had a class on Hebrews? Like where you actually spend time on that one book? It, it's kind of neat because Hebrews is basically an entire written sermon, self-contained. It's the only one like that that's come down to us uh, from, from that time period. So it was written as a sermon to be read aloud in worship, as all of the epistles were. Uh, and it's liturgical in nature, which makes sense. It's going to be used in worship, but it also talks about worship throughout it. So that's one of the big themes that you'll see going through the book when you look at it in its entirety. And you can see that we're not going to look at a lot of passages specifically today, but if you look at the way the book ends, like chapter 13, verses 20 and 21, there's a little cover note that kind of tells you what it's all about. And then, or I'm sorry, that's 22 to 25 is the cover note. And then there's a doxology just before that. So the whole thing uh, wraps itself up uh, in a little package before it gets sent out. Just real quick. Uh, yeah, it says, Now the God of peace who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, equip you in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. But I urge you, brethren, bear with this word of exhortation, for I have written to you briefly. Take notice that our brother Timothy has been released. With whom, if he comes soon, I will see you. Greet all of your leaders and all the saints. Those from Italy greet you. Grace be with you all. You know, so it's a personal pastoral letter to this congregation, which we'll talk about who they are in a moment. But the author addresses his hearers directly, as if he were there. So we have this one example in the New Testament of a homily that has come down in its entirety, and this speaker has been tasked, of course, to speak God's word, delib deliberately encouraging the hearer to listen to God's voice, not his own voice. So you get the sense that absolutely this man is a teacher. And it starts off differently than every other epistle. Every other epistle starts, you know, I, Paul, you know, with our brother Timothy or whoever, or, you know, grace and peace be to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I wanted to talk to you. It has that, that invocation and then that salutation. This doesn't. Hebrews just start, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days, he's spoken to us to us through his son. It goes right into God's doing the talking. Whoever this man is, he is the vessel. He's written a letter. He sent it to the church, but it's God doing the speaking, and we see that immediately as you start reading, uh, as you start reading this letter. And so he makes the emphasis, we don't know who he is. Uh, we have an idea, but we don't know specifically who this man is. We just know that it's God doing the speaking from the get-go. My Bible says he thinks it's Apollos. Yeah, there's about five. We'll get to those. Okay. Yep. And, and interestingly enough, that was the very first question somebody asked that missed that first session in Bible study. It's like, well, so who wrote it, Paul or Peter? It's like, well, that's an interesting question. So we'll get to that. Okay, we know he's not an eyewitness like Matthew, John, or Peter. We know that he is a disciple of an apostle who received the word of Christ from those who heard. We see that in chapter 2, verse 3. Uh, after it was first spoken through the Lord, it was confirmed to us by those who heard. So he gives us a clue that he is not one of the twelve, but he is close to one of them. 
Uh, and that also gives us the qualification, why is it included in the canon? Because he's the eyewitness to an eyewitness, which is the big, one of the big things. If you weren't an eyewitness, you had to be with us from the beginning. And he speaks with prophetic authority, and he speaks as a, divine, a divinely inspired interpreter of the Old Testament, which you'll see immediately in chapter 1. He's immediately quoting scripture. He's immediately quoting the Old Testament thoroughly and explaining it all and doing a masterful job of it. Uh, absolutely incredible. And you can make that a theme going throughout. You can't just make it a theme, okay, let's explore the Old Testament in Hebrews, because that, that's the book. That's what you'll be doing the whole time. Uh, but you get to spend a lot of time in the Old Testament with people uh, teaching this. And it's really interesting. Uh, and then, of course, so we'll look in, when you teach this book, you'll see in detail how uh, he masterfully uses the Old Testament in this sermon. And that he is also familiar with this congregation. He's familiar with them. Uh, and he is well known to it. You get that sense. So he's probably, possibly, already served this congregation in some capacity in the past, and he's looking forward to returning to them. So he is a teacher that has authority, plans to return and be their teacher again, uh, again, together with Timothy, because he mentions Timothy there at the end in 13, 19, and 22 to 23. And he includes himself along with his hearers in his use of we, uh, at the beginning, but then he also makes use of the ministerial we throughout the book. So he does speak in his own right with authority as a teacher. Now, his identity, again, he doesn't tell us, but there's, of course, lots of theories. And there are five main ones. First one is Barnabas. He was a Levite. He was a teacher and prophet. We know that from the book of Acts, chapter 4, chapter 11. Uh, and he had the gift of encouragement for the saints, also Acts 4 and 11. But beyond that kind of inference in the book of Acts, there's really no good evidence for it. Uh, but that is just one of the theories. And the other one is Apollos. You know, we have a biographical sketch of Apollos in Acts 18, 24 to 28, which uh, would explain the eloquence that this author has in his writing and also his expertise with the scriptures. But beyond that, not a lot of evidence. Now, I always thought it was Paul. Uh, but it turns out that's not the best one either. <laughs> but uh, that's an Alex it's a tradition in the Alexandrian church that Paul was the author of uh, Hebrews. Uh, because this author is using some terminology uh, in common with Paul's writing, which we're not going to get into. We don't have time in something this brief. Uh, but people have written extensively on that kind of stuff, if you're interested. And then Origen himself says that a student of Paul may be used notes of Paul's, of things that Paul said, and then constructed Hebrews from that, almost as a paraphrase of Paul's writing, and that's what Hebrews is. But again, eh, maybe not the strongest evidence beyond that. And then there is Clement. Yeah, of, the verse that you read earlier, 2 verse 3, yep. suggests that can't couldn't be Paul. Couldn't be Paul? Yeah. yeah because it, it says it was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard. In other, that would be Paul. Mm -hmm, it, mm -hmm. So, the, Yeah, because if it's not an eyewitness, then. Yeah, he's not. And that's what my notes in here, too, say. Uh, they were, St. Paul and others, and the disciples were directly called by yep. Jesus. Yep. So it kind of falls outside. Yeah, but he wasn't the same as his, his letters. Yeah, but it's got it's got it's got his learn on sentences all over. It. Oh yeah, and, and and the Greek is perfectly constructed. Yeah, also, so it's not this, it doesn't end. Doesn't give it doesn't same. sound like Paul. It doesn't no. end where exactly. So then you have Clement of Alexandria. Now Origen again states that Clement was regarded as the author of Hebrews by his predecessors, and then basing it on Clement being the associate of Paul that we know from Philippians 4.3, and then that language commonality again between Hebrews and Clement's first epistle, which there is a whole, you can look at Clement's first epistle in Hebrew and they track perfectly. Uh, we're going to come back to Clement because that's where the best evidence actually is that he's the author of Hebrews. The other one is Luke, the physician. 
Uh, Origen also states that some of his predecessors regarded Luke as the author of Hebrews. You've got his close association with Paul, which we know throughout uh, his possible Jewish identity and his literary and historical expertise. You know, Luke was very well educated. Luke may have been among the 72. So he qualifies even beyond being Paul's companion. He qualifies as being an eyewitness. Uh, let's see. There's common vocabulary between Luke Acts and Hebrews. Uh, there's a similarity in style that might be stretching a little, but yeah, there is. Uh, and then Luke agrees with Hebrews in its pastoral purpose. Uh, the theological emphasis that it puts on the priesthood, the priestly status of Christ, which is a big theme that goes throughout the entire uh, epistle. And then, of course, the work of the exalted Christ upon his resurrection and ascension. So it boils down to we just don't know who wrote it. Uh, but we do know that his hearers, the audience that was receiving this epistle, absolutely knew who he was and was familiar with him. My Lutheran study Bible also throws out modern interest in feminism has encouraged some commentators to propose that the sermon was written by Priscilla yeah. or Prisca, a learned woman described in Acts. There is that, and then there's also that uh, where you get a lot of the lady pastor stuff from comes yeah. out of this this book too. But, yeah. but it, it says the writer he was, refers to himself as a man. The participle tell in eleven thirty two is masculine. So. Very much. So if we look at if you look at Pope Clement the first, Pope Clement the first, Saint Clement of Rome, he lived from 35 to 99 AD approximately, and he was Bishop of Rome from 88 to 99, and considered the first apostolic father of the church. Uh, he was rumored to have been ordained by Peter. And his first epistle, First Clement, is the earliest, oldest, extant document of the early church outside the biblical canon. So First Clement is like as old as you can get of an early Christian writing with authority. Uh, it was read in worship right alongside the New Testament epistles. Uh, there is another homiletical epistle called Second Clement, uh, but it is attributed to an unknown author. It's one of those pseudepiphraga, so we don't know who actually wrote that. And you start looking at it and go, yeah, this doesn't sound like him. Yet it's clearly different. Uh, but First Clement, it tracks thoroughly with Hebrews. It would not be surprising to find out the same guy wrote them both. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who wrote it. If God wanted us to know who wrote it, he would have told us. But he didn't. And that goes with the author's purpose, why he didn't say anything. Because he's letting God's words, specifically the words of the Old Testament, shine through in this sermon. And he doesn't try to emphasize himself at all. Paul talks about himself. He talks about himself as an instrument of God throughout. I mean, he's not really bragging. He does a little bit kind of sound like he's bragging sometimes, but, but he's really not. But this author does not even mention himself. He's just the person through whom this epistle came. So rather, he's speaking God's word as one who has heard it from those who heard it firsthand and from the lips of Christ himself. Now, as far as the audience of Hebrews goes, we don't know who they are either, but we do know what they are. So they knew the author. They, we know that they, he had worked with them before, and then he looked forward to doing so again. You know, he writes to them, to those whom are in Italy, 1324. So they're a Christian community in Italy. Oh, very, okay. what? Right from those in Italy greet you. Yeah. Oh, yeah, backwards. You're right. <laughs> did it? Was it? Yeah. Yeah. Did I get the backwards? I did. So you were outside of England, which makes it. Oh, that's right. Fire. No, I'm sorry. Rome. I, Rome. We, we believe this is a, a house church in Rome of uh, Jewish converts. Mm -hmm. yeah, so you've got this, this church of. of uh, Jewish converts to Christianity in Rome and then outside of of Rome in Italy, they are writing to them. Sorry, 
I did get that screwed up. Jewish converts. To Christianity. How do we know? What evidence does it suggest that it's wrong? Uh, <laughs> quite a bit that gets involved and kind of weird. So that's why I didn't get into it too much. But I think... Um, who has it? I thought I made a note on that. Did I make a note on that? Well, if you use Clement, he's a Roman. Yeah, I mean, Clement, Clement was a bishop of Rome. Right. Uh, but, yeah, uh, I think Kleinin gets into that a little bit in his commentary. He's got an aside, like every other chapter is an excursus. So some of the some of the stuff's interesting. Some of it you get bogged down into really quick. But, uh, Kleining, he wrote the Concordia commentary for Hebrews. And then the other one that's good is the uh, the commentary on the Greek Testament uh, volume for Hebrews. It's got a lot of a lot of stuff in it. Okay, uh, so that takes care of audience. Somebody's got to let me know how long I've been talking because, you know, you know how I am, right? You mean we'll be here the rest of the day? You could be, yeah. <laughs> All right, then. And Timothy, I don't know why did I continue this? Why did I continue this thought? Oh, yeah, so the audience. So Timothy mentioned in 1323 was well known to the Roman Christians. We know that from Romans 16, 21. And then Papyrus 46, which is the oldest collection of Paul's epistles from around AD 200, puts Hebrews after Romans and before 1 Corinthians, which they did that kind of stuff with reasons back then. Uh, does that imply Paul's authorship possibly? Hard to say, but they put it right after Romans. So that... So groups Romans them together. First, right? Romans first, then Hebrews, as if they are almost a pair. And then the teaching in Hebrews on the lasting city of God, and this is one of the conclusions Kleinig came up with, or I don't think he came up with it himself. He refers to it. I don't remember who he cites. But the, as you may know, Rome is called the eternal city. It has been called the eternal city from way before Roman Catholicism. It goes back to uh, the period of the Republic. So the teaching in Hebrews 13, 14 in particular on the lasting city of God may be a little dig at that very secular claim calling Rome the eternal city. You know, it might be the eternal city here on earth, but you know, this eternal city of God is far more important. And then... Another point on this audience is the quotations from Hebrews and allusions to it in First Clement show that it was well known to the Roman Christians and it was well regarded by them. So that's a little circular reasoning. Well, Clement wrote it, so therefore they're familiar with it. But even if he's not the author, his first epistle was well known to the people in Rome because he was their bishop. We know that historically. And there's far too much reference in it, even if he's not the author of Hebrews, that obviously he's very familiar with it, so obviously the church in Rome is going to be familiar with it. I have a question. Sure. Uh, say Paul is the author, according to the tradition, the Alexandrian church. Yes. And Clement of Alexandria is also... I'm sorry, did I say Clement, Clement of Rome? Of oh, Rome. My mistake. Sorry. He was Bishop of Rome from 88 to 99. Yep. Okay, so aside from all of the scholarly discourse and all of these papers and books that people have written about the social status, the ethnic status of the recipients of this letter, the author himself, the author of Hebrews, is not at all interested in that stuff. So to this pastor writing this letter, what matters to him is they are a community that derives from their theological status as people with a heavenly calling. And that's going to be a big theme that's going to run through this. Uh, he picks that up in 3.1. Uh, and then second, they're members of God's household. Some of these kind of blend together. 
They're a community of saints. We see that in chapter 6, chapter 13. They're a holy priestly fraternity, which is throughout the book. And then they are sons of God, which we see in chapter 2. So you have this community of members of God's household who are a priestly fraternity and brothers and brothers of Christ, fellow saints, sons of God, who have Jesus as their royal brother, which he picks up uh, right away in chapter 2. And since they belong to this holy community that shares the status of the inheritance of Christ, they share in Christ's inheritance, they're to live and act communally with solidarity with each other. And the pastor of the, the writing this sermon always addresses them communally, always as people who are to care for one another. And they, he scatters that throughout the entire epistle. And that's going to be the major, major themes uh, that immediately get picked up in the first couple of chapters. And I'll just talk about them briefly here in a minute to kind of give you an idea where you could go with it with a Bible study, because this there's so much in here. You can pick any one of these themes and do an entire Bible study on it of several weeks and uh, not run out of stuff to say. Okay, dating, because people do like hearing about, well, when, when do they say this was written and, and what do they say today that they didn't say 50 years ago because there's always new research. Uh, the dating is, you know, like anything in the New Testament, not known perfectly. Uh, they put it between 50, 80, 50, and 90 uh, because of its influence on that first epistle of Clement. Uh, earlier than 50, there is mention of some earlier attacks in the community and the claim that they had not yet been called to shed their blood for the faith in chapter 12 uh, indicates that it's not maybe earlier than uh, 50. But as far as Roman history is concerned, uh, it does fit in the period called the, uh, the Edict of Claudius, which was in AD 49, and then their persecution by Nero in 64 to 67 AD. So these statements that are kind of dusted in the text, you know, that it doesn't come right out and say these things, but you can infer from it. It's like, well, they have not been called to martyrdom yet, uh, and that there have been some earlier attacks in the community. They can put this together and say, okay, between the Edict of Claudius and Nero doing his thing, that's probably the period in which this was written. What was the date for the Edict of Claudius? 49. And then Nero was 64 to 67. Uh, also, the earthly shrine and old covenant were not yet abolished, and priests still served in the temple at Jerusalem. So we see some old covenant things happening in chapter 8, verse 13, and then chapter 13, 10 talks about the temple, so we know it's before 70, before the temple is destroyed. Um, Then, uh, plus, if Clement, first Clement is dated uh, at or before A.D. 70, which is the destruction of the temple, uh, if, if it was written, if it was truly written before the destruction of the temple, then that means Hebrews had to have been written significantly before that because of how much Clement references Hebrews. So there has to be time for that letter to circulate and then for this author to draw from it so much in his own letter, which is then dated before 70. And the, re- the reason they date all this stuff before 70 is because they don't talk about it. If they don't mention the destruction of the temple, then it's because the temple is still there, is most often how they do that stuff. Okay. Questions? I, I, I shotgun a lot of stuff at you, but that's the way these books are. It's, it's really interesting, uh, especially when you slow it down and go, okay, well, that whets my appetite to take a couple notes and go research it because then you've got, oh, here's some guy that's devoted his life to writing about this one thing. And you're like, man, you wouldn't think there's that much there. Okay. Okay, and then the, the rhetorical devices and the rhetorical nature of Hebrews, which isn't immediately applicable when you're doing maybe a Bible study with your people, but it's applicable to you to be aware of the structure. And Kleinig does this. He does a little outline 
of every section and goes, well, here's the structure. And it's like, but you're just writing this stuff over again. Kind of like the way Just did in Luke with the uh, you know, chiasms and all that stuff. He does something similar. It's not chiastic in structure, but he's doing the same kind of thing just to show you how he comes around to his point. Uh, and there, the note I wrote here is, there's a cubic compressed ton of scholarship on the topic of the rhetorical nature of Hebrews, little of which is germane to a small group Bible study like this. Suffice it to say that since Hebrews is a sermon manuscript, it needs to be understood as something the author would speak and that his hero, hearer would receive with his ears. All right, so it's not a letter that is meant to be read. It's a letter that is meant to be proclaimed. You know, it is a sermon. Uh, and there is much in this letter that shows that the author was very well schooled in classical rhetoric and oration. And again, that goes way beyond the scope of a Bible study, but it is there. Uh, and, you know, if he's in Rome, that kind of makes sense because that's where, after the Greeks, the Romans uh, basically took over the school of, of rhetoric and oratory. Uh, let's see. So the most important thing to take away from it is that Hebrews is liturgical rhetoric. And you'll see that um, going through it, that you're going to see the, all the parts of the divine service in the Old Covenant and the New Covenant kind of being described at one point or another. Uh, so its form and its purpose are determined by its liturgical setting. So this thing is being read in church. And it alternates. The preacher is going to alternate between exposition of the Old Testament and then exhortation of what he just quoted from the Old Testament. So he's going, to, he's going to bring the congregation into it by invitation of exhorting it and instructing them. And by doing that, um, the congregation becomes engaged. They get engaged in what Kleining calls advanced liturgical catechesis. Uh, and then he warns them. He's going to warn the people what happens if you miss out on entry into God's place of rest. So he's going to start right off in the beginning of chapter 3, talk about the warning. If you ignore this stuff that God is telling you, be aware of what's happening. And so it's almost like he's preaching to two groups, which kind of makes sense. So he's leading people towards spiritual maturity by inviting them to pay close attention to God's voice, which is why he's not talking about his own voice. He starts off with God's voice from the get-go. He wants you to listen to that, that this is God speaking to you through the prophets of old and now through his son. And he is addressing them in the context of the divine service. So the congregation is exhorted to faithfully participate in the service, which they're there, they're hearing it, they're already there, but he's calling them to really pay attention, to really fully participate in the life of the church and the divine service. And by doing that, they have the assurance of their faith and they have a clear conscience. And he will talk about conscience because this author was definitely Lutheran. And he talks about conscience several times, uh, chapter 4, chapter 10, chapter 12. And then he is also going to be using the second point he makes is he uses the word of God to appeal to those who might be drifting. That might be kind of, mm, they're there in body, but not in spirit. They're just kind of inhabiting the pew. Well, he's going to give them a firm warning of the repercussions of what happens if you walk away from this. If you abandon the faith, that this, this is what's waiting for you. And then he's also encouraging those who are remaining steadfast, uh, the promises of the great rewards that await them in the world to come. And he does this through imagery from the Old Covenant worship. Uh, you're going to see how the Old Testament worship, Old Covenant worship was a type to show how those actions found a new and greater fulfillment in Christ. So what God ordained in the tabernacle shows the greater, better divine service that they have today, that we have today. And then he will use ritual analogy from the Old Testament to show what priests and people did in the Old Covenant, and it will serve to teach us what Christ does in his new covenant in his church, both in the New Testament in the first century and for us today, which is really pretty neat. Um, I don't think I was going to go into that too much more, other than I can give you a breakdown maybe of 
some of the liturgical nature and purpose of Hebrews, real quick, if you want that outline. Um, so what we, we need to look at is, okay, what was the divine service like in the First Testament? And of course, we don't know. We don't know much about it at all. Uh, but we do know for sure that it had leaders who spoke God's word to the congregation, and the author of Hebrews points that out in 13, 7, and 17. Then in 3, 1, 4, 14, 10, 23, and again, all this stuff is inclining if you go hunting for it. Uh, you have the confession of faith that Jesus is the Christ, that he's God's son and our Lord. Then we have in chapters 2 and 12 and 13, it talks about presentation of psalms and hymns as a thank offering. Because again, we'll see that how the Old Testament offering system, the Old Covenant offering system is passed. We have a new system. And what do we do? What do we bring to the table today? We bring nothing other than our, our hymns and psalms of praise. That's all we bring to the table. Christ delivers everything else to us. And so this author talks about that. And then we also see how there are our Old Testament readings by which God spoke to the congregation through the prophets and also now through his son, as we saw in verse 1 and 2. And then we have, of course, the pastor's exposition and application of the readings as encouragement to the congregation to remain steadfast, to remain coming and getting the gifts. Uh, there's reference to offering. There are petitions calling on God for help. There are petitions of intercession for other people. Uh, there is reception of the body and blood of Christ. We see in 13, 9 to 12, we see the benediction and doxology. And then we see at the end of the liturgical greeting for the bestowal of God's grace on the people who receive this document. So we have this very long sermon that is meant to be read aloud in the context of the divine service. And then it's self-referential because it's talking about why you're here in the divine service doing the things we do. Uh, so it's interesting in that way. It's that I'm sitting here in church learning about why I'm in church. Why do I do this every week? Which we kind of need that sometimes because... You know, you know your people do it, and you know you do it. We go on autopilot sometimes, and it's like, boy, Sunday's over. Like, church is done. I'm home. What? I, you don't even realize the time pass sometimes. It kind of goes foggy sometimes. Or am I the only one that that happens to? <laughs> uh, for us modern folks, um, you know, is it a charismatic, because you've got, you know you've got charismatics in your, in your pews. You know, was it a charismatic service where these gifts of the Spirit were distributed and utilized? Yeah, it talks about that a little bit. But it grounds them in the story of their salvation and the sharing of the Lord's Supper. That's the gifts that this author is really pointing to. Uh, was it a service of prayer and praise? Yes, absolutely. You know, they heard the word, they ate the body and blood of our Lord. Uh, the service of the word had all kinds of readings from the Septuagint, um, very much like the Greek-speaking synagogues in the diaspora. So even these Jews here in Rome, they are re they're reading the Septuagint, and this author, of course, is quoting directly from the Septuagint. Um, that's about it. So you see all of this uh, liturgical structure just goes throughout the whole thing. So then just real briefly, like the first unit that you have. Oh, the, the, the way I looked at doing this as a Bible study was to look at, well, what do we do with Hebrews in the lectionary? Like how much of this book do we actually cover? And it turns out it's quite a bit, which I now can't find. Where are you? There you are. You know, so if you look through the one year and the three year, just about everything in the book is covered except for a small part of one, a small part of five. Uh, chapter six completely is missing. A good chunk of seven is missing. Uh, all of chapter eight. A part of chapter nine. And then a few parts of 10, 12, and 13. Oops, I can't call. These are missing? That are not covered in the lectionary. But most of the rest of the book is, and it covers from the period after Pentecost to Holy Week to uh, a couple of festival days, uh, Christmas Day in particular, Good Friday. You know, your Good Friday and Christmas Day texts for years A, B, and C are from, from Hebrews. So it's covered in the, in the church year. 
So I said, okay, well, let's look at this and chunk it up and let's just cover what's covered by the church year. Not necessarily in you know, church year order, but here's, here's what it covers, because if it covers the church year, then it must cover pretty much all of doctrine in one way or another, right? Because that's the whole purpose. I want to know why they didn't cover 6, 7, 8, 9. Yeah, yeah. I see why they didn't cover 6. There's, there's some challenges in there, for sure. <laughs> yeah, there, there's, there's, a couple, there's a couple interesting. Tough ones. Oh, yeah, the peril falling away in particular. Yeah, right, yeah. yeah, that's hard. And then, you know, seven is, you know, Melchizedek, which he's interesting, but it's odd. Right, yeah. You know, Melchizedek was an interesting guy. I had to write, I wrote a paper about him. Oh, you did? That, that, there's amazing how much stuff has been written about a guy that's only like four verses yeah. of the Bible. <laughs> yeah. And it's amazing what people come up with. Like, this is really interesting, but I don't know. The only thing I got out of it was like, I no longer think that Melchizedek was a theophany. Because that would be kind of weird for Christ to be called a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek if he's Melchizedek. That would be a little too self-referential, I think. But anyhow, so, th so that's the way I looked at it was let's chunk it up by the church year and see, uh, see exactly where we go with it. And so that's where we've started. And we're going very slow. Because we gave all kinds of asides. We, we're spending a ton of time in the Old Testament. Like the section you'll come into at chapter, is it beginning of chapter 2? Yeah, you get into chapter 2, verse 5, and the next thing you know, you're talking about Jesus, the merciful high priest. So let's talk about the high priesthood. And you wind up spending time in Exodus and in Deuteronomy talking about how the priests were consecrated, how were Aaron and his sons consecrated, what happened, how were they ordained, and then how did God do that for Christ in the New Testament? How do they parallel? And there's a ton of that stuff comes to bear, and the author is quoting all this stuff. So it's really interesting. You wind up spending a lot of time in some Old Testament things uh, that you know a little bit about, but you don't spend much time on sometimes, or you haven't done it in a while. So it's a good review, and people seem to really enjoy that. We're in the Old Testament, but we're not studying an Old Testament book because that gets kind of scary and tedious sometimes, uh, unless it's stories everybody's familiar with. Oh. So, yeah. So just for example, in Hebrews 1, the first four verses, you know, we're going to talk about, you talk about how you're going to be talking about Psalms. It's going to be all the Psalms that he's quoting, talking about how Christ is the heir of whole things, pointing to Christ's total rule, how he sat down at the right hand of God. Like, why is God saying he's higher than the angels now? What's all this talk about angels? Like, how is he a little lower? Why is he higher? Why, why are they even talking about all that? And he's setting the stage for what comes next. So it almost seems like why we know that Christ is higher than the angels. We know why he sat down at the right hand of the Father. But he's setting a stage. So he's kind of telling you things you know that we kind of understand. And then you're going to go, oh, I see what he's doing as soon as you get to the next section. And he, he kind of works that way. So you go, yeah, I know this stuff. And then he, boom, makes it. But ah, that's why he's telling us about it. So it's really, uh, really interesting. And that's where I'll stop for today, because otherwise we actually start doing verse by verse stuff. But yeah, that's the short version of all the background stuff in Hebrews, which I find that stuff fascinating. Like I said, that was the very 30 second version of it, because these different people have gone on and on and on at length about some of these different theories and structures and and you can go through Hebrews with these structural ideas, like three or four or five different ways, and come up with a whole new way of, of teaching it. You're teaching the same material, but um, you're getting there a little bit different way. And ultimately, it's to show us you know, how we worship God in the Old Covenant and how the better, greater fulfillment of that worship in Christ today that we have where God comes again to serve us. Oh, and how we have direct, that's, sorry, that's the big theme, is how we have direct access to the Father through the Son. We no longer have to give our offerings to the priests who then offer the sin offerings and the wave offerings and all that stuff.